This is my second video on this book, Atomic Habits. If you've not seen the first, I'll link it up here. But basically, it just went over four pages from this book that appear very early on, where the author, James Clear, explains why forming good habits and becoming someone who simply does those things on a regular basis, come what may, is of far greater importance to your long-term prosperity, productivity, happiness, health, than setting specific goals. As a super simple example, forming the habit to go jogging four times a week is of more importance than setting a goal to run a marathon if your aim is long-term fitness. Have that habit and never achieve the goal and you're still a runner, but if you have the goal and never put the habit in place, you aren't running a marathon anytime soon. However, that is really oversimplified, so you should go and watch the other video and I'll also explain in it how I came across this book in the first place. That it's important to have good habits and avoid bad ones is probably obvious, but what James does in here is way beyond just explaining that. He really does break down what a habit is, what causes it to become a habit, and that allows you to sort of habit hack. Most habits we kind of fall into almost without necessarily knowing why. Bad habits are notorious for this. Why do I bite my nails? Why do I eat junk food watching TV after nine? So with this, you can unravel how habits form, and then not only can you deal with the ones you don't want, but you can put in place steps to help you develop the ones you do want. So James talks about the four requirements for a habit to become a habit. Various people before him have defined this as the habit loop. Four steps. A cue, a craving, a response, a reward. The cue is that you notice something, the craving is you want it, the response is you do it, and the reward is the positive sensation from having done so. A simple example of that loop would be that when I sit down at 9 p.m. after a day's work and relax, I notice I'm hungry, I want a snack, I eat the snack, and the snack was good. If you get all four steps provided on a regular basis, then that thing becomes habitual. Now what James does is he turns those four steps into what he calls the four laws of habit forming. Make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, and make it satisfying. And you can reverse those to do away with bad habits, make them less obvious, unattractive, hard, and unpleasant. Now my suggestion is you just go buy this book because there is a huge amount of other stuff covered beyond what I'm whizzing through here. But let me just go through some of the ways that I've rejigged what I do based on those four laws. Law one, make it obvious. In a way, this is the most important step. With no obvious cue, you can't move forward with the habit. If I was forced to wear gloves all day, I'd not bite my nails and I'd not miss it. They simply aren't around and obvious to provide a trigger. The cue is missing, the habit dies. So with a habit you do want to trigger, make the cue in your face. It's what supermarkets do by sticking the sweets and the candy at the checkout. You can't miss the trigger. Now James talks about a couple of ways you can do this. One is based around time. So you say, I'll do X at Y time, and that becomes the cue. For me, 9 a.m. is when I'm at the gym. It just is now. I simply associate the two, time and activity. Another is to habit stack. So you put a habit you want to start with one you already do. So I was finding I wasn't listening to all the podcasts and audiobooks I was downloading. I could never find the time. So now I listen to them in the sauna. I already sauna four times a week, so stacking the podcast time along with it is easy. But the one I like most is this. Learn that environment often matters more than motivation. Here's an example. My morning routine, when I get up in the morning, my gym bag is always at the bottom of the stairs, ready for me to grab an hour later and out the door. It's always there, ready to go, because I put it there every night. The same as I put out my protein shake that just sits and waits for me to get back from the gym and drink around half 10. I don't come down in the morning always motivated to go to the gym, but my environment, my kit ready to go is a cue. It's almost subconscious one, that takes me in that direction, motivated or not. Another example is that in the garage, the training routine is always on the cupboard door, the bike always ready to go, the trainers racked. All these little bits, they're my, my fingernails, always there, much easier to respond to. If my routine was on my phone, trainers shut away, that's kind of wearing gloves and hiding those cues. I want to be exposed to them. And talking of bad habits, this law one, make it obvious, for me, it's the easiest one to flip 
and tackle problems. I mentioned the Cocoa Pops already. This isn't a junk food free house, but we have a basket in the kitchen that most of it lives in, up high, out the way. And that basket only comes out on a Saturday night, movie night. If those snacks, crisps, whatever they are, were just there when I opened the cupboard to grab a tin of tuna, I would be in trouble come movie night. It's such a simple one. Know your trigger and then take steps to remove it. When I'm needing to be really strict with my diet, I'll block into my diary time to do some video editing or reply to comments on YouTube or balance my bank account, whatever it is, at 9 p.m. When I know I'd otherwise sit down to watch TV and that's an environment that I know acts as a cue to me thinking I'm hungry. Law two, make it attractive. By far my favorite one, the supermarket can stick what they like next to the checkout. If it looks rubbish, you won't buy it. I like to tackle this one in two ways. And the first is the most straightforward. Make what you want to want to do seem amazing. People often tell me I don't need the Nike Vaporfly shoes, the carbon fiber spaceship bike, the Wahoo kicker in front of the massive TV. There's cheaper, simpler options. There are. But when I chuck on the Nikes to go running or fire up Zwift on the big ass telly or wheel the bike out of the garage, I'm thinking this is pretty cool before I even start. And yes, Expensive things are pretty cool is not a shock, but there are plenty of low cost ways you can add attractiveness. I've done a couple of videos reviewing subscribers home gyms, their pain caves. And every time I see a garage gym with bare brick wall, I think the same thing. Paint that wall. I painted my garage the week we moved into this house. The very first thing in that garage was a tin of paint and then some cheap lights. Just enough to make walking in there feel good. The space attractive. Whether it's what you wear, where you go, the kit you use, don't be afraid to make it appealing to you. Do you need that new pair of trainers? Maybe not, but if it's affordable and it will get you out running in them, then see it as an investment in you. I have lots of watches. If I have too many watches, in fact, probably buying watches is a bad habit. Anyway, my Garmin Fenix watch is the only one that every time I put it on, I want to do something active. That makes it a bargain in my book. And the second part of make it attractive, this law that makes us crave, desire a certain behavior or action, is to have it fit in with emulating the close, the many or the powerful. We are social creatures. Even if you think you aren't, you're watching YouTube, you are. As such, we tend to find it appealing to copy, to fit in with a social group. The close, that's friends and family. If no one in your house exercises or cares about their diet, it won't make it easy to live your life in contrast. For example, here, everyone works out in this house. It's just part of all our lives. And its importance to me is understood by them mostly. When I get back from a race or a competition, I'll be asked how it went. That is better than finding myself at odds with those around me at every turn. Even my dog comes running with me. It's all very well being above average, but if you're surrounded by people far below average, which of course people are perfectly entitled to be, it just becomes isolating. The many. Following emulating the masses has never been easier. Because of this, you can follow millions online, billions of people if you want. It's good and bad. I used to think following the average person was setting the bar really low. And if you do it as simply as that, then it is. But if you're careful with the groups you follow, which clubs you join, it can be really motivating. One of the reasons I do so many 10K runs, trail runs, obstacle course races, is when you're stood on the start line with hundreds of other people all taking being healthy as serious as you, it's almost a relief that you're not alone. The same with joining the right Facebook group, follow the right Instagram tag. You can surround yourself by huge numbers of people that share your views and knowing that what you do is the norm makes doing it just more attractive. And the powerful. Perhaps the most attractive entity to follow for your health and fitness motivation is someone with status, fame, celebrity. Because it's the most attractive to do, if you follow the right person, that can be incredibly positive, an amazing experience. But there are clearly lots of wrong people to follow. This, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, the powerful in these worlds are not always the most ideal to emulate in all areas. Ideally, openness, honesty would be everywhere. You could look at anyone you want to copy and think, well, I like their work ethic, maybe their focus. I'll draw inspiration from that. I'm less keen though on taking large amounts of performance enhancing drugs. So I'll pay not too much attention to their workout regime as it won't be realistic for me. 
Equally, you could think, I do want to do that too. That's up to you. But without the openness, it's hard to tell. The example I like to use, it's like running a restaurant and you follow a famous chef with a string of their own successful restaurants and you emulate what they do in their restaurants, hoping to achieve their level of business and therefore ultimately financial success. But what you don't know is that a large part of their income is actually derived from them running an OnlyFans account where they dance around naked, wearing a chef's hat perhaps. Who knows, you might have to pay more for the chef's hat thinking about it, it doesn't matter, it's not important. Now there's nothing wrong with that. Running an OnlyFans account is obviously perfectly legal. But if they were suggesting that their restaurants were the sole cause of their prosperity and you were copying them to hopefully achieve a similar result, you'd probably want to know that you were missing a significant element. If you did know, you could then choose to copy them, but adjust your expectations on what you might achieve. You could stop copying them and just copy somebody operating in a way that's more comparable to you. Or you could open your own OnlyFans account too, and you now know you're actually copying them. In the absence of such openness and honesty, you're stuck. You copy them anyway, and if it doesn't work, you don't quite know why, you could stop copying them when actually they could be the perfect person to copy, or do you just start taking pole dancing lessons just in case? So all that does not mean that I don't suggest following the powerful, but it does mean that I suggest doing it eyes wide open. Personally, I tend to gravitate in the fitness world to people who are overtly open and honest about what they do, or I just discount a large amount of the information I'm fed well, I know there is a good chance the person does not have all their cards on the table. And in the fitness social media world, there's an awful lot of people I wouldn't play poker with. Pay that man his money. Law three, make it easy. We are pretty good at seeking out the path of least resistance, almost irrespective of where it leads. Even if it doesn't lead you to where you want to go, you'll often do it anyway. If I drive up to Burger King and there's a huge queue for the drive through and KFC is empty, I'll have chicken. That's not a real example. In reality, I'd queue for the burger, but you get the idea. So you want as few hurdles, as few drive-through queues between you and the habit you want to develop. When you look at bad habits, the ones that are toughest to break are the ones you can almost fall into without trying. So make the good ones just as easy. My gym bag at the bottom of the stairs is not just an environmental trigger to set me on the path to the gym, it makes going to the gym easier. I grab it and I go. I don't spend time looking for my trainers or finding my weights belt. It's just there where I left it. Even the actual gym I go to is one I picked on this basis. The better local gym is about a half hour walk or a good seven, eight minute car drive. It's not a big deal. It's nowhere near as easy though to the one that I do go to that's just a five minute walk away. In fact, I no longer even walk. I jump on my scooter and I whiz over there. I'm therefore combining two laws because not only does it make getting to the gym easy, it also makes it fun, law two, make it attractive. In fact, sometimes I find myself on a weekend in the afternoon, I might have trained already in the morning, but to go and grab my scooter and whiz over the gym, do some core work for half an hour, it's as easy as actually going in the garage and working out. And talking of the garage, the bike is always ready to go. Everything here is automated. I walk in, I tell Alexa to turn on the gym fan, start playing Rocky IV, and I'm ready to go. And this law is the one I find works best with diet issues. One of the reasons that snacks, crisps, chocolate, candy, it's so tempting, because it's so easy. If you had to cook a junk food snack, I guarantee you'd snack less. So first of all, make snacks less convenient. The easiest way to do that, leave them in the shop, and then make the food you do want to eat as easy as possible to get your hands on. I have a drawer in the kitchen just for my bits and pieces that no one else wants. Protein powder, oats, nuts, nut butter, cocoa nibs, just healthy stuff I can chuck on top of some Greek yogurt. And it's there to make that an easier option than grabbing something rubbish. I don't eat a healthier snack in the evening because of enormous willpower. I eat it because I'm lazy and the way I have the kitchen set up is the quickest thing to prepare. Law four, make it satisfying. James talks early in this section about a concept I find fascinating because it's behind so many of our problems nowadays. The idea that humans now, we're so disadvantaged by having the bodies and minds that were designed to be most useful then, 10, 20,000 years ago. And that ties into things being so satisfying so directly. Then we acted in a way that provided immediate benefits. You go out hunting today, you eat today, your problem today, not having food, is solved. So reward instantly works well in those situations. It got us here after all. But now though, 
a lot of what we need to solve won't happen in a day. If you're 100 pounds overweight or you can't run 50 yards and you want to take up jogging, those solutions are weeks, months, maybe years away. They're well worth going after, but you won't be getting any sort of immediate satisfaction the way we were designed to seek reward out. Now there's a few suggestions in the book as to how to make the thing you're trying to establish as a habit satisfying, when at first glance it might not appear to be. But the one that is most straightforward to understand and implement is adding that instant reward that the habit might not otherwise give you in. For example, when I was doing my Ironman training last year, each session on its own gave almost no noticeable reward. The improvements I was getting in my fitness on the bike, running in the pool, they were coming, but they were so small they were hard to see. So instead, I got into the habit every evening of updating my training diary on the software that I was using, and I'd tick off the activities I'd done, and it would give me a little weekly volume of training done metric graph type thing, and that, seeing that go up every day, became the satisfaction. On the odd occasion, when I didn't train, I'd skip it. For whatever reason, I'd sit down in the evening, I'd have my iPhone ping at me at 9.30 saying, update diary, I'd have nothing to add. And I was immediately regretful that I'd not put more effort into getting whatever it was I'd missed done, done. Consequently, the next day, extra motivated. I'd get out, I'd make sure it didn't happen again. I do the same when I'm tracking my diet. I use MyFitnessPal app on the phone, and each day I complete the diary for the day, and the app then tells me how many days in a row I've logged, and it has that maintaining a streak bonus that pops up, and that becomes the satisfaction. Because obviously the weight loss, or weight gain, whatever it is you're looking for, that doesn't show up daily. And if you're thinking that updating your training diary, that doesn't sound like a very sufficient way to satisfy my primal desire for instant gratification, feel free to make up your own. But bear this in mind, one of the best lines in the entire book in relation to providing rewards is this, don't cast a vote for conflicting identities. Now at the beginning of the book, and I mentioned it in the last video, James talks about how learning to identify yourself correctly is more motivating than simply aiming for a specific goal. So for example, be a runner, don't just do a marathon. Be healthy and active, don't just lose 20 pounds. Be what you want to be. So don't cast a vote for conflicting identities means, as a straightforward example, don't have a giant piece of cake as your reward for completing your two hour bicycle ride. Because if you do, what are you? Are you a cyclist that takes their diet seriously or are you someone that likes to stuff themselves with cake? Interesting stuff, I hope so. This book has shaped how I go about maintaining my health, my fitness, my motivation for those things more than anything else, or more accurately, the ideas in it, because I had some of those ideas before I read the book without really knowing ever why I was doing them. After this though, not only did I understand those things that I was doing, I understood why they worked and therefore I was able to improve on them and add to them. If you're serious about wanting to get better at anything really, I highly recommend it. As it says on the cover, an easy way to build good habits and break bad ones. And if you can do that, you got most things covered.